and ten that's deflected and picked off Mosey. He'll take it in. It's a pick six and a touchdown. The New York Jets select Zach Wilson, quarterback, BYU. <laughs> everybody welcome back to the turn the jets podcast i'm your host will parkinson at will pa 11 on twitter instagram and tiktok joined by a special guest today nfl insider kway radio host broncos uh covering the broncos benjamin albright ben how you doing today i'm uh, i'm doing all right apologies for uh, for being in the car and giving you guys the scenic tour of uh of denver but uh you know we wanted to try to get this thing in so this is the time i had yeah now it's uh we get a jets fan to get a little uh you know sneak peek into what uh what denver looks like um, obviously, you know, off to, you know, in a week three tonight, um, you know, Texans, Panthers, uh, an awesome quarterback matchup of Davis Mills and Sam Darnold. But um, what have your uh, biggest takeaways, I guess, been from the first two weeks of the NFL season? What's really kind of caught your eyes? Has it been Teddy Bridgewater being up there in uh, yards per attempt? Or is there something else that's kind of really stood out to you? Well, I mean, uh, in Denver, that's certainly the thing with Teddy and the throwing the throwing the deep ball, which is not so if that's a that's a hallmark of him just beating up on bad teams, or if that's the real Teddy that's just been hidden all this time. But uh, we'll find out. Um, you know, around the league, I think how hard the Texans played. It was a shame to Rod Taylor got hurt. I, I thought they were going to win that Browns game, and um, you know, I think the Texans everybody counted them out. You know, picked them to go in seventeen and lose the bye week even and. Uh, somehow, uh, you know, they, they, they scrapped it together. And I think we're going to see them get the brakes beat off tonight by a stout Carolina defense. But, um, you know, I thought they were. Um, I, I think the coach on the hottest seat right now is probably Mike Zimmer. Uh, I know people talk about Zach Taylor, Matt Nagy. Um, Nagy is, but they, they worry all together. But I think Mike Zimmer is really because it's a retool and all this kind of bar. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think those are some major key points, at least uh, from early on in this season. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. A lot of the uh, coaches that struggled the most with the vaccine stuff, have, their teams have not started off well. Minnesota definitely comes to mind. <clears throat> I wanted to kind of get into a little bit of uh, the Broncos as a whole, obviously off to a 2-0 start, Look, have looked pretty good. Um, I thought they were a quarterback away from being a legit um, contending team. Obviously, AFC West is extremely difficult, but I thought with the Rodgers stuff, you know, if they get Rodgers, they're a Super Bowl contender. What is, what's been the biggest uh, kind of impression you've gotten from the Broncos as a whole uh, through two weeks? Obviously not playing great teams, but still. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a sense of confidence. They're starting to build confidence back in themselves that they can win football games. That's the first thing you got to do if you've been a bad team for a long time, you know. And um, I feel like they have been a quarterback away for some time, but they've really, like, the roster's really loaded. And even with the injuries that they've sustained – here over the last couple of weeks, you know, you lost inside linebacker Josie Jewell for the season. Bradley Chubb's going to be a half a season. Ronald Darby, excuse me, Ronald Darby's out. Um, you know, you've, you've just had some some major injuries, uh, and, and they've just found way, you know, just plug the next guy up. And, uh, you know, when, when the next guy up is Kyle Fuller, you know, <laughs> at corner, or, you know, it, it kind of works out. And, you know, the pass rusher, the next guy up's uh, Malik Reed, the guy who had, what, six and a half sacks last year. And, you know, and, and play. so, I, you know, I think, uh, I think they're a team that's, that's like getting their feet under them still. There's going to be some hiccups along the way, but right now they're playing better than anyone really had anticipated. And I think that's that's something they're trying to draw from. Yeah, they're, they're an interesting team, especially even like a Jerry Judy who looked awesome, um, obviously pre-injury on uh, in, in the Giants game. And yeah, they're playing two teams that obviously Jacksonville and the Giants are, uh, you know, no, uh, no Kansas City and Tampa Bay, but at the same time, you know, you got to win games. I know Aaron Rodgers said the other night, it's like you have to learn how to win every year and um, it's nice to, I think Broncos fans, obviously home opener, how, uh, how crazy of an atmosphere. The Jets have not had their, uh, finest moments in Denver, obviously Jets fans, 1998 is not pretty. And then the, the Tebow game, and I think that was 2011, um, not pretty as well. So how crazy of an atmosphere can Jets fans be expecting to see on, uh, on Sunday afternoon? I guess the fans tend to come out as a home opener. We haven't had a lot. Uh, and I can tell you, covering those teams, I mean, it was weird in the empty stadiums last year. It was just odd, just bizarre. And, uh, having fans back and st- sort of seeing that is, has been uh, has been fun. It was interesting in Jacksonville, the, the Broncos fans outnumber our fans uh, at that stadium. And I can't imagine what 70,000 screaming, you know, 74,000 screaming fans. 
you know, over here at Sports of the Arrow, what is it now? Invesco and Powerfield at Mile High. Oh, looking forward to it. Loud. And, and so, uh, you know, I think uh, when you've got two two offensive tackles that are uh, that have been struggling a bit, um, you know, I think that uh, having a loud crowd out there can lead to some false start stuff. So they're going to have to have all that stuff down. Yeah, no, I'm on the same page as you as well. I think the Jets, uh, you know, the Jets communication was a huge issue week one. Um, you know, offensively, just the offensive line struggled with the Panthers' pass rush. They did a better job last week. MetLife was um, exceptionally loud, and then obviously things went south very quickly, unfortunately, uh, you know, for Jets fans. I was curious kind of your, you know, process or your thought process going into, you know, the season with Zach Wilson. He's a guy who's very, very talk, you know, obviously talked about very heavily as being the number two overall pick and, um, you know, his mom on Instagram and the headband and the whole nine yards. What's your kind of takeaways of the way Zach's played so far and kind of how does that match up to what you thought he was going to be coming into the league? I mean, there's been flashes and then there's been some, you know, some, oh my God, you know, I mean, that's what happens when you have a rookie quarterback. I mean, that's just naturally going to happen. I I think Zach's a fine quarterback. He's going to be just fine. They do need to finish building up that offensive line. Uh, It was a shame that Beckton went down. That was, that was a problem. Um, But, you know, Zach Wilson wasn't, uh, you know, he was the number one quarterback on a couple of teams boards uh, over Trevor Lawrence. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, early struggles and the way that they've done that stuff there, um, it's everybody's always concerned. What are we concerned about now? What are we concerned about now? I, I think it's just a natural part of the growth process for a guy like Zach Wilson. You know, he's never, he's always been the, probably the most dominant athlete on the field. And so now he's surrounded by dominant athletes. He's got to get used to that a little bit. He's got to learn to rein it in. He's got to learn. He can't play YOLO ball. He's got to learn that he can't, um, you know, get out there and not athlete people. And I think he'll be fine, you know, doing that. I thought the jets approach, uh, to the quarterback position was a little bit interesting, um, you know, going to the camp and everything with, with guys that had never taken an NFL snap. Um, that, that concerned me a little bit. Um, now I'm familiar. I, I know that staff up there and, you know, they're, they're smart guys, but I, you know, I would never have done that. I'd never gone in with a brand new quarterback and, and a bunch of guys never taken a snap. Um, but you know, I, I Robert Sala is a sharp guy. Um, you know, they, they've got plenty of sharp guys on that staff. They'll get it figured out. It just, I think they know that this is a growing year. They know this is a registered year because you just, there's not enough there. There's, there's talent on that roster on both sides of the ball, but there's not enough there yet. And so they get the quarterback in place. They need to do a few more things. The offensive line, you know, the skill positions are, are almost there. Um, and then you got to overhaul that defense, which is, is playing better than the personnel that they have for, a, you know, they got a bunch of guys that aren't scheme fits for that. And they're still playing better than, uh, than, than you think. So, um, you know, I, I think there's signs of optimism, but I think you got to understand that this year was always going to be a registered year. Yeah, no, I, I I totally agree in that sense. I think sometimes it's hard, you know, football, you wait, uh, you wait all year and then you get 17 games and it's like you lose for so long. It, it makes it incredibly difficult to kind of be patient. And, um, you know, all, all off season was all gas, no break, but like it's patience and a redshirt year. And then, I don't know, you get in the atmosphere at 75,000 people, the stadium going crazy. And it's really difficult to, uh, to, to tone it back down and, you know, the booing and, um, I was kind of curious in your thoughts on that. It's been a it's been a hot topic on Twitter. Oh, the Jets fans shouldn't be booing Zach Wilson or the team. It's week two. Um, do you have a problem with the fans kind of letting the letting the team know? You know, we're not happy with losing to the eleventh straight time in New England and are the you know breaks beating off us, or is it you know is it too early and it's okay to to do so? I mean, what what is what is booing accomplish anyway? Nothing. It's just That's you know, fair. it's just noise. At the end of the day, it's just noise you make, right? So like, I, like I've been back and forth on this over the years, and I've kind of settled on after talking to a bunch of players. Like, you paid for those seats. Whatever you do in them, it's, it's up to you. You know, uh, you make yourself look like an idiot when you're booing the team you're rooting for, uh, unless they're just making bad decisions, and it's been a, a a lengthy thing of bad decisions. But you know, I mean, booing poor performance from from rookies and a, and a squad that, let's be honest, I mean, did anybody expect the Jets to make the playoffs this year? I didn't. Um, I mean, they're over under is five and a half. Like that's yeah. That's we're talking about there. a team. Yeah, a team's going to be picking top five, top six in the draft. I mean, that's that was expected, you know. So, uh, I, you know, I, I think that you make yourself look silly doing stuff like that. But you know, New Yorkers, you guys have a different attitude about that kind of stuff. You know, I think you'd boo your own mother if she didn't make the uh, uh, the risotto the way you wanted. Yeah, I can't. I can't say. I uh, can't deny that. Um, but uh, no, I. You know, it's it's interesting. You know, that that game. There's a lot of the way the Jets played actually overall was kind of impressive. Yeah, you mentioned the defense. Um, the Jets have some big names on defense, but it's not really, there's not a lot of depth. It's, you know, the Quinn and Williams, Sheldon Rankins, defensive line, John Franklin Myers played really well. And then, you know, Marcus May and, and CJ Mosley are big name players, but then a lot of the guys, the rest of the roster is super young. Um, 
how big of an advantage do you think the Broncos offense will have? I know, you know, like we've mentioned, they've been pushing the ball down the field, but I know you tweeted out a little bit and, and I've seen this a lot. So how slow the offense has moved, but how efficient they've been at the same time. Um, do you expect that to kind of stay the same for the rest of the year or um, that's just early season getting everyone integrated? Uh, kind of both. Um, they want to be, they want to be high scoring quickly, but they just aren't. They're a, they're a team right now that uh, they've got three points on their opening drive for the season, 20, 21st half points over two games. That's, that's not a whole lot, relatively speaking. Um, they're a team that wants to be greedy with the early points, but reality is they're a team that wears you down. They just have these, these incredibly lengthy drives. Um, and, they, and they wear you down. And that's, that's the thing. By the time the second half comes around, you're gassed. They lead the NFL in time of possession. They don't snap the ball until there's less than five seconds on the play clock every play, no matter what. Uh, and they're just methodical. And it, like I said, it, they, they go side to side. They'll, they'll, they'll take a vertical shot. They'll come back with the run game. Um, the offense, like I would hate to play against this offense right now. It's not the most talented offense in the world, but it just wears you down. By the time you get to the end of the third quarter, you're gassed. And that's where you see the Broncos really pull away is that, you know, they open the, they open the, the second half with an offensive drive in the last eight and a half minutes. And if you're a, you know, if you're an offense um and, and the broncos usually have been, have been closing the half with drives too so if you're an offense that's that's uh, playing against the broncos you you could have been sitting for an hour and a half you know and by the time they get done they get you back out there you'd be cold you know you, you went through your warm-ups you got out there you did it and you're, you're flat cold again getting back out there so there's there's some advantages to the way that they play but i know they want to get some points they want to end those those first two drives with more points than they've been doing speaking of wearing people down UFC fights this weekend, and my bookie's bringing you an awesome promotion. This Saturday, there will be blood. Head to mybookie.ag and get on the UFC first blood promotion. When any fighter on the main card bleeds, you win. The second you see blood, you get paid. With this bet centered around five minute card bouts, including two title fights, you know the octagon won't stay dry for long. So take advantage of the opportunity to make some easy money with my bookie. Nick Diaz has bled in three of his last four fights. Always is bleeding. Conor McGregor fans would know that. Robbie Lawler is a leaky, has a leaky fault for her face as well. So, you know, by the end of the five, for five rounds, um, you know, there will be blood spilled on, uh, on that carpet. Head to mybookie.ag now and use the promo code TOJ to start off with a double deposit bonus. That's promo code TOJ to double your money so you can double your winnings with mybookie.ag. Bet anytime, anywhere, any place with mybookie.ag. Now back to the interview with Ben. How are you doing? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm on the same page. I think there's a lot of, there's still a lot of talent. Javante Williams is the guy that, um, I think it's going to be a stud in the NFL. I mean, you know, the Jets have his his back. You know, Michael Carter as well, who who's looked really good. He looked really good last week. Um, you know, a Broncos fan super excited about Javante. I know they've got a lot of other weapons and Noah Fant, for example, Portland Sutton coming off the torn ACL, and um, you know, there's KJ Hamler. Go, the list goes on to Patrick, all those guys. But how exciting are, are you know are Broncos fans about Javante? Um, you know, first and foremost on the offensive side of the ball. They're pretty excited. Broncos fans haven't really taken to Melvin Gordon the way that they should. Melvin actually was pretty brilliant down the stretch last year, um, you know, playing really well on a, on a, a shorthanded team. Um, and, and Melvin is running back one here. Um, you know, I know a lot of people are excited about Javante, but Melvin's a better pass blocker. He's a better pass catcher. Um, and, you know, he's, he busted that 70 yard TD, uh, you know, in week one. Um it's just been interesting because the two teams they played so far, the Giants and the, and the Jaguars focused in on the run game. Like they did, they didn't really respect Teddy Bridgewater. So they focused in on shutting the run. So the per carry averages for Javante and Melvin hadn't been all that great, but they, they've gotten situationally, they've gotten the job done uh, most of the time. So, uh, you know, I, I, Broncos fans are excited. I think they want Javante to start, you know, how everybody always wants the younger, newer thing, you know, to start or whatever, but, it, but Melvin's like, he's just, better right now Javante's a better runner but Melvin Gordon's a better running back if that makes sense yeah no I mean, it makes a ton of sense trust me we're dealing with the same thing with Denzel Mims and um, you know everyone wants to run Jamison Crowder out of town even though he's the most proven you know he's an extremely proven good NFL player but that's a uh, that's a whole other discussion obviously flipping on the other side of the ball um, Patrick Sertan who I really liked out of college I thought you know thought he was really good and he's looked awesome he looked awesome in the preseason he had a really awesome great interception I'm not sure why Trevor Lawrence was going at Patrick Sertan last week with um, second and third string receivers out there. That, that was confusing. Um, he's a guy that people got to be excited about in Denver because league wide, it seems like everyone's like, this guy is legit and he's going to be just like his dad. Well, they should be. The problem is that his career is going to be forever intertwined with Justin Fields because you had a segment of the fan base that really, really wanted Justin Fields. And, um, you know, I, I, on my show, we had the calls and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and I, I kind of tweaked some of those people a little bit this week. I was like, well, both Pat Sertan and Justin Fields had an interception this past weekend. So it's basically the same thing, right? Um, 
you know, I think uh, and Justin Fields may have a fine career. Who knows? But uh, he, he didn't play particularly well coming on a relief of Andy Dalton. Um, you know, and we'll see. He's going to get his start this weekend. We'll see what he is. Uh, and he may end up being a Hall of Famer. Who knows? Uh, but, you know, Pat Sertan is a really good corner. In fact, the New Orleans Saints were trying to trade up from the 20s uh, to get up with Detroit to try to get him because they knew that uh, they knew that Carolina was in on uh, J.C. Horn and they weren't going to they were going to budge. So they were trying to get up ahead of both of them because they knew Broncos and Dallas were both going to take Sertan if he was there. So, um, you know, he's Sertan's a guy that everybody wanted. Everybody viewed him as, as one of these guys that's going to be a, a you know a ten year, twelve year player in the league at, a, at an all pro type level. So, um, you know, I, I think we've seen flashes of that. He uh, in the first game against the Giants, he got caught a little flat footed, was playing off too far, didn't cover the cross, crosser, tried to get in trail and got burnt. Uh, and it was a good welcome to the league rookie moment. You know, kind of kind of woke him up like, hey, wait a minute now, everybody on these fields are great athletes. You can't play like that anymore. Uh, and, and, and you know, trail him that far. So. Um, but he, he gets it. He's a smart guy. I got the chance to talk to him when he, when he got drafted, uh, he came sat down for a while. He's a real smart guy. And, uh, you know, that, I think that'll benefit him a lot in Vic Fangio's defense. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, Urban Meyer had the infamous quote this week of, uh, every week's like playing Bama, which I know was not meant to be, make him sound stupid, but it made as a person that like, I'm not sure how you didn't know that was going to happen coming into the league with probably the worst, if not, or one of the worst rosters, but that's a whole nother discussion. Um, don't want to trip on urban too much and see if he, you know, he might get a, you know, be a little upset with himself and have to quit his job after four weeks, but um, kind of wanted to just get into a couple, one, couple other, you know, quick AFC West and, you know, AFC questions as a whole. Um, the AFC West looks obviously, I think preseason wise, people thought it was going to be really good. And the way the Raiders are played, um, has made it even more, you know, intriguing. I think people probably thought they were going to be more of a down year just because the whole offense won, the leather would pick, the whole nine yards. Where do, you know, where do you see the AFC, AFC West shaking out? Because obviously Kansas City is the class of the division, but you've got three other really good teams in that division that are, you know, all can be playoff teams, you know, in them, in them of themselves. Well, yeah, you've got a tough division. It's it's one of the toughest in football. I think the NFC and AFC West might be the two toughest divisions in, in pro football right now. Um, you know, I, I, it's it's interesting because Kansas City, their defense has kind of fallen apart. Um, they, they had the, the defense over the last two years uh, uh, has been just good enough, and, and it's kind of not now. We saw that a little bit against the Ravens. And also that offensive line, they rebuilt it this offseason. That offensive line isn't as good as it used to be. Uh, they're still trying to find time to gel and everything. They've got talent on paper, but it's got to take time to come together as a unit and, and, and gel. I think Kansas City would be fine. I think they'll win the division. Um, I'm, the team I'm down on is the Chargers. I know everybody was, was blowing them up with Herbert and all that. I, I don't think they're all that good. Uh, they've got some problems on defense. Um, and, and whatever you think of Anthony Lynn as in-game decision-making, the offensive philosophy that they were, they were utilizing really maximized Herbert. You know, a lot of max protects, PA shot play type stuff. And, uh, and Herbert needs that, you know, I mean, he's got the cannon, but you protect him uh, and, and he'll get it done for you. The problem is, is that Belag is hurt. They got Storm Norton out there and I've seen high school, you know, left tackles that, uh, that you could probably toss out there might be more effective right now than Storm Norton. So, um, you know, it, it was, uh, it was just bad. He was getting worked, uh, you know, in that, uh, in that game. So yeah, I, Michael I, Parsons who found out he was going to play defensive end the day before the game and got destroyed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely destroyed him. And then, you know, I, I, I like there's uh with the Raiders, I mean, they got a heck of an offense. You got to respect that offense because they're going to put points up on you. And everybody laughing at John Gruden, man, you're laughing at the wrong side of the ball with the Raiders. Uh, the problem is they were running a David scheme. You know, they were trying to run old school Tampa to not the variants like what the Colts ran or anything. Because kind of there's some modern updates on the, on the really, really old school hits. Uh, they're really cover three, and they're playing a little bit better. They've got a heck of an offense. You got to start probably the most underrated quarterback in the NFL. Um, I, I don't understand the hate he gets because he's a good quarterback. Uh, yeah. So, you know, their car gets a lot of unnecessary hate. I mean, I don't think he's. That guy put eight and nine Gruden. They both. You call like a top five. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm on the. It's interesting with. Derek Carr is a guy that's always kind of uh, him and Kirk Cousins and a few other guys feel like they get kind of lumped into that, um, you know, nine through 14 level quarterback where like you're not, you know, they might not be the elite, um, you know, Mahomes, Watson, Rogers, you know, obviously Brady, you know, guy, but they're also not, they're not, not franchise quarterbacks. So, um, right. 
you know, so it's just, it's an interesting kind of dilemma there. A couple other quick things, uh, you know, before we wrap up here, but um, you know, obviously a lot of injuries, kind of the quarterbacks, you mentioned one before Andy Dalton, you know, going down, Justin Fields going to get that and get a start this week. Miami is an interesting one. Um, not just, not even to deal with Deshaun, but Tua is obviously a very polarizing player and people are very either in or out on Tua. I'm super down on Tua. I didn't love him as a prospect. I thought when you've had 500 million surgeries before you enter the NFL and throw a heavy ball, it makes it difficult. Um, and he's now been hurt again. So um, how how in danger is Miami? Because they're a team, everyone was like playoffs, realistically, their game away. And then they get boat raced last week by Buffalo. And then, you know, how excited are you watch Justin Fields play? Because, you know, he didn't look great last week, but obviously people are very keen on watching Justin Fields play, uh, play football. Yeah, I don't want to watch him play just because I want to watch him play. I'm not a big Justin Fields fan or whatever. Um, I'm not against the kid or anything. It's just, you know, I, I want to see him play. Um, it, you know, with Tua, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I, I wasn't a big Tua fan. Uh, Miami made that offer for Watts and it wasn't enough. Um, and they'll, they'll keep after The Texans, they don't want to trade him until next year, though, because they don't want to screw their own draft picks by doing it. You know, you send Deshaun Watson somewhere, well, he's going to make that team better and and then they're going to lose out. Their draft picks are going to be worse. So, um, yeah, there, there's a couple of teams out there that could use some help right now. I, I um, uh, with, with Fields and that situation, Dalton looked better last week than, than Fields did. Fields didn't look good at all. Um, so, I, you know, I want to see, I want to see what he can do uh, with a week of prep, you know, and kind of see, um, you know, everybody's dogging Matt Nagy for not playing him, but Nagy knows he's not ready to play. You know, he was certainly didn't look ready to play uh, last week. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, it's kind of a catch 22 because not playing him is going to make you worse and probably cost you your job if you're Matt Nagy, but at the same time playing him might ruin him for the future. So it's, it's really a catch 22 there, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him play. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm on the same page. You feel this guy that's, you know, obviously you know, all these rookie quarterbacks I want to hit on one other rookie quarterback that um, is getting a lot of love and he's doing not very much. And that's Mac Jones. Um, I've now got to see him in person was not, not imp- I thought he's fine. I think he's in that Alex Smith and, you know, previous Andy Dalton, you know, prime Andy Dalton mold where they're not going to lose you the game, but it was surrounded by the right talent and coaching can and certainly, um, you know, produce. What have your initial thoughts been on Mac? Because it seems like if I have to hear one more, oh, he's Tom Brady thing, it's going to really, it's going to set me off to do some horrible things. <laughs> Well, you're not Tom Brady until you're Tom Brady, right? You weren't Joe Montana until you were Joe Montana. I mean, you know, we were still having the Brady-Montana debate up until like two or three years ago, and Brady was like 40 years old at that point. Um, I like Mac Jones. Uh, He looks like a serviceable starting quarterback right now. We'll see if he can grow into something more. I don't know if he has that killer instinct that Tom has or not. Um, Certainly has the same body by Krispy Kreme Tom had at that point. But uh, I think, uh, you know, I think at the the end of the day, it'll play out for us. I think Mac looks serviceable. But again, you've got an offense that's that's trying to put him in positions he can win. Trying to get that. That's what you're supposed to do. But we haven't seen him deal with adversity. We haven't seen him drag a team somewhere at some point, any of that kind of stuff yet. So it's uh, Brady comparisons are premature. The only thing they shared is that they both they both once played for the, the New England Patriots. The idea that Mac Jones is Tom Brady is, is just, you know, ludicrous fodder that, that people delude themselves with in order to make themselves feel better. Yeah, well, I, I couldn't uh, couldn't love that comment more because I feel the exact same way. Um, you know, last uh, you know, last thing here, we'll get your prediction kind of for the game and uh, you know, get your rolling. Um the like around the NFL, obviously, right now we've been dealing with a lot of different trades, and there's a lot of people that get rumored. Jamie Collins, the guy that you know has been talked about as being moving, and you mentioned a couple of Broncos, um, you know, linebackers, edge rushers being down. Do you see the Broncos being involved there? Any any teams that kind of come to mind, or is it going to be one of those difficult ones just because of the money that's involved, um, you know, on the Collins contract? It'll be difficult because of the money. I think he's going back to New England, actually, but um, I, I don't think he's coming to Denver. I don't think they're interested. Um, you know, they went out and got Micah Kaiser off the Rams practice squad. He's got scheme experience. Uh, and the Broncos only play with one linebacker most of the time anyway. You know, they, they, they prefer like a hybrid dime or heavy nickel type look with three safeties rather than uh, than having two linebackers. They just had to when Josie was out there because he's your tackler. Um, so that, that's that's different. And Alexander Johnson's a starting linebacker anyway. So I, I really don't think they're going to do that. Um, everybody I've talked to didn't think that was going to happen. Um, um, you know, internally. So, um, you know, that said, um, you know, I, I've been surprised before, but I, I no, I don't think that they're going to trade for Jimmy Collins. Yeah, no, I just had saw like getting floated around and people were connecting Denver. I, I saw you shot it down. So I wanted to kind of, uh, kind of ask you about it. And people went into the Jets and there's just no chance that's happening. They're not, they already pay CJ Mosley 19 million. And on top of that, they play with one linebacker as well. And then they have a second guy that's a converted safety and Tom Sarah, Jamie and Sherwood are, um, Quincy Williams, who's not very good, but 
that's a conversation for another day. I have no idea why he, uh, you know, I guess it's because if your brother is trying to negotiate an extension, it's always nice to have him on the roster. But, um, you know, last thing here, obviously Sunday's game, thoughts, predictions, uh, you know, how do you, how do you see this one playing out? Broncos are by favored by 11 at the moment. Um, pretty hefty spread, but honestly deserved based on the way the Jets have played the last uh, 18 months. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be a fun day for Jets fans. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I, I think the Broncos are very, very confident. Uh, they're very keyed in to make sure they don't overlook this as their first real test is next week with the Ravens. Um, I, I think you're probably looking at the Broncos getting 28 to 31 in the home opener, and they're probably holding the Jets to somewhere between 10 and 14. I, I think it's going to be a blowout now. I think it'll be closer at the half. Uh, again, they'll, they'll get those sustained drives and then they'll punch them out, you know, in the third and fourth quarter. But uh, so but I, I don't think it's going to be particularly close. And I do think the Broncos cover. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm of the opinion it's somewhere in the 28 to 13 range, somewhere somewhere in that where, like you mentioned, it's it's close. Zach Willis makes a few plays. People get excited. Um, the Jets look competitive. And then at the end of the game, it's, you know, maybe it's 21, 13 Broncos drive again to kind of kill the game off. And it's a comfortable 28 to 13 win. Um as long as Zach Wilson doesn't have any, I know Joe Caparoso put this on Twitter before, as long as there's no meme interceptions where TikTok kids are roasting the Jets, I think you're, uh, I think you're on a, you're on an upward trajectory. And if I have one more person send me that, I appreciate everyone listens to this podcast. I get it. It was frustrating to be there. I don't need to hear about a 12 year old roasting uh, Ryan Griffin who sucks. So, um, you know, we're going to we'll leave it with that, but obviously appreciate you, you know, hopping on, uh, you know, Ben obviously does a great job. Make sure you're either, you know, tuning in, you know, KOA Radio out, you know, Colorado, uh, pop for Bronco stuff, but honestly, NFL, any kind of NFL knowledge, um, you know, insider information, you know, Ben's a great follow on Twitter and, um, you know, I appreciate you hopping on. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. And by the way, here's a little, a couple of tips here. If you guys can get some special teams done, because the Broncos special team sucks out loud in terms of coverage and uh, they suck at quarterback contained. So if Zach Wilson can get out there and scramble around. You might have a shot. Use RPO. Zach Wilson's not a bad athlete. <laughs> he might be 200 pounds soaking wet, but he's a good athlete. And, um, you know, we'll see how the Jets, uh, you know, kind of scheme adjust there. But, um, yeah, everyone, uh, you know, enjoy their uh, enjoy their Sunday. And hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully the game's competitive. And that's, uh, that's all we can ask for. Uh, all right. We'll see.